got the elements in your hand this morning, would you just take the one that's with the bread? That'd be the easiest. And would you just lift that up to the Lord this morning? So we honor the very presence of Jesus, the risen Savior. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We honor your presence here in this house this morning, Lord. We give you glorious praise and honor, Lord, with our lives and with our worship. You are the risen Savior. It's so important this morning to recognize the, the presence of God. To know that we've not come here today gathered in this house, this place of worship, just to go through the motions of religion. How many of you know he rose from the dead? On the night before he went to that, that event that would change history, to the sacrifice of his own life for our sins, he was gathered together with his disciples in the upper room. And the Bible talks about how he instituted something we include in our worship today, which is communion. The Bible says, and Paul was talking about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24, and Paul said in verse 23, one verse before, he said, for I've received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Paul includes here kind of a warning to folks that when they take this communion, it's to be a reverent and a sacred thing. It says, for wheresoever or whosoever shall eat this bread, drink the, this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. So, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. That wasn't there in order to keep us from communion. That was written there to bring us to communion so that we would not formalize this and make this into an event that just becomes religious duty or obligation. As a matter of fact, Jesus had written in another place in the Word, He said, this communion that He had shared with the disciples, He said, I'll not do this again until you've all come together in my kingdom. And there we'll have communion. I don't know if it'll be one more time or many times, but I know that first time when we're gathered around the throne of Almighty God, and Jesus says, let's get the bread and let's get the drink and let's bring this together. And Jesus, one more time, causes us as a celebration of worship around that throne to remember the sacrifice that he gave. That'll set the course for eternity. And as you're gathered together this morning, he said, as oft as you do this, remember. We remember what he did for us as you hold these elements in your hand this morning. I want to give you just a moment in your own silent way for you to examine your own heart and as your bid an invitation by Christ himself and by the word of God to receive these elements, the body and the bread and the blood that's represented in the drink as a memorial, as a way of praising and worshiping and honoring God in this moment for what he did over 2,000 years ago. So as he said, the Bible says, and he took the bread and he broke it. And as he broke it, the Bible says, Jesus looked at his disciples as I look at you today and said, take and eat, for this is my body. Thank you, Jesus. Stir each of our hearts this morning we're examining ourselves and as we're coming before you in reverence and honor. Touch us today, oh Father. Touch us, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way in this service. Jesus then took the cup. He said, this is my blood in the New Testament. 
as oft as you drink it, remember what I gave for you. Let's drink. Most appropriate for you to worship. Most appropriate to be filled with gratefulness and thanksgiving for the mercy, the faithfulness of our God. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. Lord, we honor you. We praise you this morning. We are standing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. On holy ground, Jesus. Hallelujah. Lord, how sweet your name. Could you sing that together? And I know we know that We sing this again. I'd like our ministers, if they would, to come across the front. All of our prayer warriors. We are standing. We're standing. special prayer. I'd like you to make your way to the altar right quick while our ministers are here to serve in prayer. If you'd like special prayer, Brother Van Hoos, we would like you to come if you would. Jesus now. Would you worship him this morning? We're standing on holy ground. We are standing. Thank you, Thank Lord. You that you're in this Would house. you lift your hands this morning and honor the presence of God? You might have come in with a need, and maybe you didn't come forward at this altar, but I'm believing right now for God to touch you right where you're standing. Lord, we believe you're the one that fights our battles. You're the one, God, that brings our healing. Lord, you're right there with us. You said the ever-present help in the time of trouble. We give you every care and we give you every need. I give you every family, every husband, every wife, every young person that's represented here today. Let the work of God be accomplished. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We honor your presence here today and we give you glory. In Jesus' name. Before you're seated today, Sister Myrtle and Brother Watkins, Pastor Watkins came forward for special prayer for three different needs. They don't get to come home very often. So I don't want them to just come by here and, and us just had a, a prayer in the altar and that be it. I want the whole church to gather. We've been praying for Sister Karen. We've been praying for this little grandbaby. But we've got a, a grandbaby that needs a miracle. We've got a 13-year-old grandchild that needs a miracle. And she has a daughter named Karen that needs a miracle. How many of you know God is a miracle-working God? We've seen it in this house. We've seen the miracles of God. We've got a man. The Lord has been giving us testimonies of the great miracles and healing and deliverance. So I want you right now to stretch your hands towards our Pastor Emeritus and his wife. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we're believing you together. We agree together and come, Lord, in the name of Jesus. 
and believe you for a healing touch, God, right now over this little infant. We just bring this child to you. Ask your work to be accomplished in his life, God. Touch him by the power of the Holy Ghost and minister healing today. We're looking to the author and the finish of our faith, the one who provides for us, God. We honor your presence. We ask you to bring healing to this grandchild, Lord. 13 years old needs your touch today. We believe for a miracle as, Lord, the armies of angels are dispatched from this house. We're believing, God, that there will be a miracle report even today. And, God, we believe for this daughter. I pray in Jesus' name, touch and minister according to your word, according to your power and your might. God, you said it's all in you. You are the one who brings our deliverance, brings our healing. We ask all of this to give you the glory, give you the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' wonderful name, and everybody together said amen. 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 One more time, put your hands together and let's give God praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to remember Brother Jesse Van Hoos in prayer. He came down, he needs a healing touch in his throat. He's been dealing with this situation for quite long enough. And I want us to, to pray for him, but also Brother Van Hoos, all week long, we've been praying for the comfort of the Holy Spirit, that he would be your present help in this time of difficulty. We believe and we know that your precious little wife, who would have been sitting right there beside you, she, she's dancing the streets of glory, standing taller and stronger than ever. She's got a lot to celebrate, but I know when, uh, with us, you know, there's a little bit of that, that loss in our heart, and so we're praying for you today. You not only have to do without her for a little while, but so do we. We love you today, Brother Van Hoos. We love you very much. I want to thank you for all the continued prayers, for the prayer list that you have in your bulletin. Please take that home with you. Make all through the week a priority to pray over those needs as people request those prayers and ask that God touch so many good things to tell you. One is that uh, we're excited. Well, number one, I'm going to tell you this. I am not worried about a popularity contest. You do not have to. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I, I would like to sp support Gary Turner. And <laughs> I'm just an easy target. <laughs> and if Missy's not careful, I'll, I'll support her next week. <laughs> pie in the face, not only for the Family Fun Festival that we'll have in the fall, but also working towards our new building and the building fund. So give in your support towards Gary's pie, and we'll appreciate that. <laughs> our young people are coming back today from National Teen Talent. Um, you know, they didn't get first or second prize, and they were a little disappointed. And I was just flat out mad. Uh, I'm crying, you know, somebody's just, it's fixed. But, uh, they did so awesome and so wonderful, and uh, Tasha Little uh, performed, and, and according to the superior ratings, she got third in the whole world. I'd say that's pretty good. Yeah. I'd say that's pretty good. <laughs> and the only reason she didn't win is because three of the judges was, was deaf, and they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and also our, our ladies' uh, synchronized movement team. They did a wonderful job, and in the whole world, going up against Romania and the UK and Canada, they came in fourth in the whole world. So we're excited for them. Thank you for the spiritual gift surveys you filled out last week. Thank you for the hundreds of you that came uh, Sunday night to the ministry booths and how you went around and talked. And many of our staff pastors were very excited because so many of you signed up for new ministries. Still others of you, I want to give you a little bit of a comforting word this morning. As I was coming in Sunday night, because of the way the questions were worded, uh, one lady came up to me, and she sings in the choir, and she's very active in several of the ministries, and she said, well, that's it. I said, what? She goes, I resign. I said, why? She said, well, according to my spiritual gift survey, I'm not even gifted in music, so I'm getting out of everything. You know, that is not the tell-all. It's not the tell-all. It was just a, a way to get you looking deeper into the Word of God where the gifts are truly uh, there revealed. So, you know, hundreds and hundreds of gifts uh, all throughout the Word of God, just so many different areas. And don't limit yourself. If, you, if it doesn't say you're a prophet or a preacher or if it doesn't say you're an evangelist, if it even doesn't say you got a song, understand that God's put gifts inside of you and in your heart. And 
and those are there for the use of his kingdom. And he is going to anoint you. Brother Marvin, it is good to see you in service with us today. Wonderful to see Brother Spatafora right here. Would you wave at us? You don't get up to Ohio very often. We're glad that you're here with us today. God bless you. Our ushers are coming to serve you as they do. I would remind you that all the loose offering will always go to world missions and our missionaries around the world we support with our gifts. We take this offering and the 830 morning offering to not just bless them with an offering, but to meet a need. So I always ask that you prayerfully consider what your, what your giving is so that we can uh, be a part of helping them to fulfill the work that they're doing around the world. Several missionaries that love us, we support them and they're always in contact with us, letting us know how our gifts of support are helping them around the world. It's so exciting. Exciting to know that that Rafa Care Center we built in Romania is up and running its first year. And God has been blessing and working with the gypsy community there and giving them free medical service, missionary medical service. And that's a wonderful thing. For a long time, the government tried to take it over over there and they wanted it to be run their way and charge everybody. But the Lord prevailed and that medical missionary facility is up and running for free for those who need it. So I'm thankful today for the gifts that help us to keep that going. Also, praise God and thank you for your gifts and your tithes. As you do that, the community here at Middletown and at Stratford Heights is able to continue the ministry we're doing to reach out into this community. Brother Russ shared with me in tears as he was leaving the, the, the morning service that 13 uh, inmates received Christ into their life yesterday at jail ministry. <laughs> praise the Lord. I love that. I love to celebrate when people come to Christ. I think we ought to report it, we ought to shout it, put it on signs and put it on marquees. The more that are coming to Christ, that's the mission of this church. That's our number one priority. If you've come in here today, the number one priority and mission of this church is to see the lost saved. We're not a country club. We're not an organization that just wants to go out to eat together all the time, although we do that. But we're here. We exist for the reason of going into the harvest and reaching the lost for Jesus Christ. That's the purpose of the church. And so as you help me now in prayer, let's pray for our missionaries. Let's pray for the ministries. Father, as we come before you, we thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to be used in your kingdom. God, as you bless our hearts and bless our lives, we're able to give back. And Lord, I thank you for every gift and for every giver. I pray that you will touch our missionaries on the field as we support them, Lord, and as we do what we can to meet the needs in their lives, that you will touch us and bless us so that we might, Lord, further the work of your kingdom in this earth. And I thank you for those who are faithful to pay their tithes, Lord. This helps the ministries here, the staff, and keeps the lights on, keeps the ministries going in our community. So I thank you, Lord, for all that people attentively care about, pray about, as they give to your kingdom work. In Christ's name, amen. Amen, amen. Praise the Lord. We thank you, Lord. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like you and me. How many of you were that wretch and God saved you by his grace and love? Through his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'd like you, if you would, uh, just for a moment, if we're going to take a moment in the service, I'd like to recognize John and Shannon Henderson who are here today. They have drove all night. They had a group from their worship team that was over at the Jesus Culture Conference in Chicago. And they literally have driven the entire night. But they needed to be here in this service today. John and Shannon, would you guys come forward into this altar? I'd like our staff pastors, if they would, to come. John and Shannon and little Maddie have been uh, one of the things we do in ministry and raising up young men and young ladies in ministry and sons and daughters is that we also sometimes need to send them out. Amen? And John and Shannon have accepted an opportunity to worship and continue to worship and serving in a ministry capacity at the Kings Point Church over in South Lebanon. And they're going to be there as ministers of music on an interim basis and God's will be done and what that will entail. But right now we're sending them off and I'd like you to stand with me if you would and stretch your hands toward this altar as we pray over them. They're still part of our family here at Stratford Heights and they love us. They're not leaving because they're mad. They're leaving because they're sons and daughters and we're sending them out. So we're going to pray over them and anoint them with oil and ask God to be with them and use them in ministry over at this church that needs them so desperately. 
So as we're praying for them, choir, if you'd stretch your hands towards them, let's pray together. you let them know you love them. Many of you don't know the story. I, I pretty much raised John. He was 12 years old when he first came into the church and through circumstances he pretty much lived in my house and I even helped him with school clothes and everything else in the sun. But uh, proud, very proud to see this young man be called up into the ministry to be talented and to be used as he is and now to be called out. So we love you. We're your home church no matter what. All right. All right. You may be seated. Coming to minister to you this morning, for those of you who don't know him, I want to reiterate, he'll be at the meet and greet this afternoon uh, immediately after service. We invite you, if you've been new and, and, and especially since Pastor and Sister Watkins are here, if you've come within the last year, we would invite you to come back by the meet and greet. Um, so that you can meet them. They want to know you. And they they've took a directory home the other day, and they've seen so many new faces, and they're trying to figure out who you are. And so if you've come within the last year, then you're welcome to come back by the meet and greet. If you've definitely been new in the last month or two months, six months, we definitely want you to come by and talk with the staff and meet them and, and just uh, have more fellowship with them as we get to know you better. So we invite you to come. But it's our honor today to have a special guest in our service the gentleman who raised most of us um, in ministry gave me my very first opportunity. Uh, he looked at me, and I, I went nervous and scared to death as a young man fresh out of Lee College. And I had a resume in my back pocket, and he had already prayed about it, and God had already told him. So I walked into the office, petrified, trembling, and he said, well, what do we got to do to get you started in here Monday? From that point forward, we worked together 18 years, and he helped to raise me in the ministry. And I love him and held, held him as a father, a spiritual father. He's a spiritual father to this church. He helped formulate this. He built this building that you're in, and God anointed him for 18 years to serve as our pastor. And we honor him. We love him today, and he's coming to share the gospel and the word of God with you. Let's honor him today. church in a place last, oh, I, I tell you, I don't know how time gets by fast when you're having fun. Went to a church not too long ago, and when I walked in, I could tell that something was amiss there. I got, we got through the singing, got to the preaching, and it was really in stir then. I could see grown people back in the back of the church milling around, whispering one another and talking. I started telling them to let us in on the secret and we'd all have fun. They didn't do that. They disrupted the service. And uh, I come to find out, well, let me let me tell you, let me go on through the story. I, I, I don't know why I got off on this. I don't have a 22 minutes to preach. And uh, I don't know why I'm telling you this. I know why I'm telling you this. It's because I'm so happy to be here in my church this morning. This is my home. This is my home church. Praise God. Anyhow, I didn't, I didn't want to go. The pastor didn't level with me, didn't tell me where he was going. 
he's going to try that a church 25 miles up the road. And he didn't tell me that. He told me he was on uh, business for the state overseer. I didn't know if he's gone to Kalamazoo or where. He was right up the road from me, about 25 miles. If I'd stuck my head out the door, I probably could have heard him hollering and screaming. But anyhow, I got through preaching. It was a tough fight with a short stick. I got through preaching, and I announced that what I'd be speaking on that night, I begged the pastor when he left. I said, let's don't have church tonight. I'll have to drive back another hour and a half up here. Let's, let's don't, no, you need to come on, you need to come on. And so I agreed to come on, and then these guys, they decided not to have church that night. I announced what I was going to speak on that night. A little guy got up after me, and he said, Folks, we will not be having church tonight. Right after I got through saying we're having church. Folks, we will not be having church. I was about a half a dozen steps down the aisle, and uh, I wheeled around and looked. I said, We're not having church. He said, By order of the pastor's council, we're not having church tonight. Well, I, I found out afterward that this guy was up the road trying out at another church. Please cut this out of the tape that you're doing. You know, this will get a lot of people listening to this church tape. And uh, they'll know I'm spilling the beans on them. They need the beans spilt on them. They need something else spilled on them. But anyhow, I got through preaching and it uh, went down and said, well, good when he said we're, we're not having church tonight. I said, good, then I'll go home. I can rest all afternoon. I called the pastor and I said, man, why didn't you level with me? Well, I didn't want you to get involved in anything, man. I said, man, I'm involved in it. When I went down in that beehive, I got involved in it. They were madder than hornets. And I had two or three of them tell me afterwards, said, we know where he is. We know you know where he is. I don't know where he is. Where is he? He's up at Grenada, crying out up there in a the pastor. I said, well, good for you. But anyhow, I'm so happy to be in my church this morning. I have Stratford Heights religion. I don't know why anybody would go anywhere else than church. Got to be connected somewhere. So good to see this church making strides forward. So good to see your pastor making strides forward. I knew when I passed the mantle to him that morning that he was God's man for this church. I knew that this church was going to go places because the Lord had let me see it going places. I'm so thankful to God that he let me have this opportunity to live long enough to come back and see it. I just passed my 80th birthday, 22nd of this last month. I had always get given the different stages of the ministry. And I'm going to believe that somebody's going to tell me when I get to this third stage. First stage is tireless. Next stage is tired. Third stage is tiresome. And then third, fourth stage is retired. Now, if somebody let me know when I get tiresome, then I'll back off and watch do nothing but to criticize. No, I won't. I want to retain my reward in, that I have earned diligently. I want to retain that reward. Well, we had one good service this morning. It was good for me. Myrtle, and, Myrtle Stan, this is a beautiful lady. She married me and took me off down to Mississippi. <laughs> brag on you everywhere we go. Oh, well, I don't need that thing. I can talk loud. It's so good to be back home. We miss y'all so much. We think of you every day. We think of every time a crisis comes up in our life, the first thing we want to do is call home. This is now home. My 
daughter called me like this and called Jack yesterday. And she said that she's been going through a terrible time for the last almost year now. It's put us through it. That's what it happened by. But she has hit so many snags. She's made some wrong decisions in her life. And she's real hard on herself. But she just won't let go and let God do what he wants to do with her. She's very talented. And she called yesterday and she said, Jack, she said she called him on she does now. She said, "Is one of y'all standing for me tomorrow?" And she said, "I need a hand, and I believe, if for no other reason, that may be why we're here this day. We've been trying for what? It's been a year, almost a year next month since we've been here, and we love it. We love this church, and there are a lot of faces that I do not know, and I can love you anyway. I don't have to know who you are, but I want you to continue to pray for us because we need your prayers." Thank you for praying for me when I've been hospital. I'm doing, I'm doing good. I'm still having a little problem, but nothing major, nothing we can't handle. And God is still in control. He is still the answer. And this little newborn baby is two months old, and he, we really need, we really need these things that we prayed about. We really need miracles. So thank you so much for praying for us. We love you, and it's good to be here. And anytime y'all want to come, you come one family at a time. We can take you. We can sleep by four or five. <laughs> we love you. God bless you. Myrtle suggested several times that I come by myself. I said, no, these people will kill me if I go up there without you. They won't see you as bad as they do me. We have a 13-year-old with her namesake. Her name is Lena. And she's having some problems. They had to leave the vacation that we went on Thursday. We, we left Thursday and came to Moorhead, Kentucky. And was there, and Moorhead was Myrtle's brother. And we didn't know. We thought they were still going to stay through Friday and leave Saturday morning. But she had a panic attack or something. And they had to go home right after us on Thursday. So remember her in your prayers. The devil would like to have a heyday with our church. She told me not so long ago, she was telling me how she loved her church. She said, I love my church so well that she's gone to another church in town. She came back. We can't tell her, baby, you don't know what church is. But she was up here, she came up here several times see us while we was here and so she knows what real church is but where are the miracles in church today where are the miracles of healing we need to take, take inventory every once in a while and see if we really measure up where are the miracles well where is the anointing oil where are the prayers for the saints of the saints for the sick where are the prayer lines where are the people dancing up and down the aisles of the church where are the people who speak in tongues? Where are the people who have faith in God? We need to look and see if we're really measuring up. We need to take spiritual inventory every once in a while. And this is what Jude did in the book of Jude, one chapter. This is a powerful book. The Lord laid this on my heart to speak to you, and I'm not going to be able to even touch it. I'm going to leave my sermon outline with Ray and let him rework it and do what he wants to and preach the book of Jude. The Lord laid this on my heart. and But I want to share with you. And turn with me to Jude chapter 1. Won't anybody jump ahead and read chapter 2 now. Jude wrote to the churches. This is no specific epistle to any church. It's all to all churches. He says in the second verse, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. 
For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were behold before of old ordained to this condemnation. Ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only God, Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll put you in remembrance. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. The angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness under the judgments of that great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities round about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise the many, and speak evil of dignity. I want to stop there because this is something that that God has uh, wants me probably to back up on some. I want to share with you that you know this, this little one verse, one chapter book is a powerful book, one of the most powerful books in the Bible. It has this is James' brother. He said he was the brother of James. James was Jew, was Judas's was Jude's brother. They were both brothers of our Lord Jesus Christ. They came to know him afterward. They didn't believe in him to start with. They chided him in about the seventh chapter of John's gospel and said, You go up to Jerusalem to this meeting up there. You need to go on up there because they they want to see you, and they want to see the miracles that you do. They, nobody hides himself. Go on up there. And they were throwing taunts at him, but he looked at them and said, I am going up, but this my time has not yet come, but your time is always. They lived the life of ordinary men afterwards until they got into ministry, and then they became different men. But I want to share this with you this morning because... This is something that is necessary. Jude said, when I wrote to you of the common salvation, it was necessary for me to write to you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. The faith, what? A measure of faith? He was talking about the doctrinal faith. He was not talking about the measure. It all is congruent. It all corresponds with each other. But the faith that he was talking about here is the faith that Jesus gave to the people, the church, the organized church. And he said, some men have crept in unaware. They were ordained for this thing. The Satan had them ready, ready to go when this church got started to plant the seeds of discord in the church. And you can see that Jesus, when he spoke in the kingdom of the parable, kingdom parable. He said it's like men who came and sowed good seed, but then others came at night and sowed evil seed in with the good seed. And he, Jude was reminding them of this and telling them that, oh yeah, that thing could be a calamity still. warning them and telling them that the time had already come. Now this happened about 100 A.D. As of this, if, it was, if they had crept in then, he said the time has come when it's going to be near and, and you need to be aware of these men. Think of what's happened in the last 1900 years, the last 2000 years. And Jesus is really needing a proclamation today from the pulpit. We need to proclaim that you need to contend for the faith. You need to, when you say contend, you mean to stretch forth every effort you can, put forth every honest effort that you can. To contend means to, to 
struggle, fight, to struggle in a way that you've never struggled before, to fight in a way that you've never fought before, to retain this faith. And he seemed kind of mad. I want you to listen to some of these. He said, these are filthy, these are spots in your feasts of charity. When they feast with you, feeding yourselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about with wind, trees whose fruit withers, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom it is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And Enoch also is the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. By the way, I have the book of Enoch. I don't know why it wasn't listed in the canon of the scripture, but I have the book of Enoch, and I can tell you, I can cite you this verse and chapter in the book of Enoch, where this is from, where he said he'd come to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that, uh, that are ungodly among them, of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, their mouth they speak great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. We have people today that you might as well be talking to the post outside with the lights on it if you try to convince them of anything. They are smart aleck, they're smart to the core, they have a mind set against God, against the church, against any kind of organization. You know what the whole problem is today is? We, uh, they don't believe in the God of the Bible. They don't believe in the Bible. We've kicked the Bible out of the schools. We've disrupted everything in the courtrooms. Now I don't know why we pray, but they still pray for the Senate when the Senate meets. It's still, they have the chaplain of the Senate speak. As far as I know, they're still uh, supposed to do it anyhow. That's the only place in the world, in our government, where the, the, the prayer is made. But I want to tell you this morning, it's high time that the church remain the church. Please always remain the church of the living Christ. Please always do the things that God wants us to do. Please always have the miracles operating. Please always have prayer going. Please always have prayer, these doors open for people who want to come into this church and pray. I remember several incidents. I'll never forget over here when I, this was my prayer spot over here when I came in every, every morning to pray. And uh, every morning, that was before they had the fellowship hall built back in the back. There, the, there were two angels that walked in this door over here, walked by me, walked down here and walked down this aisle. I, I stood up when they, to, when they came in and backed up. And they, I watched them as they walked. It, the ordinary men, they, they had on different clothes, just a little different. They had on street-looking clothes. You wouldn't have looked at them. You go anywhere now and you find every kind of dress code. There is no dress code. But they walked down this aisle, walked out in the foyer, walked through the wall. When they came to the wall, they didn't stop at the wall. They walked through the wall. Well, we didn't have a money enough to do anything with. We didn't, couldn't, didn't, we were already head over heels in debt here with this building here. No money to start back there, but they let me know, the Lord let me know that morning that we were to start this building back here and the money would be there. I understand now that about two or three years from now, this whole church will be paid for. Well, probably won't because Brother Ray has already heard from God on a building program. I want to tell you something. If you get a hold of God, and if you pray and seek his face, he'll show you what to do, and he'll give you the wherewithal to do it, what he chose you to do. What God wants, God can provide. What God wills, God will provide. He can do anything. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, that God can't do. He wants to prove us sometimes. He said, come look through me, saith the Lord, here with. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and see if I won't open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you're not able to contain it. Just pay your tithe. Give in this offering. Give in the offering. 
Give what God gives you grace to give. And he'll add more to you. And he'll show you what to do. He'll make it possible. I don't know how. I told Brother Ray not to get to churches deep in debt. Not to go head over heels like some churches do. They go and they just keep building when they know. It's like not setting down and counting the cost first. It's like a foolish man who sets down. He doesn't set down. He counts the cost gets the money in hand and knows what he's going to do before he does it. Because if you don't, you'll be like the foolish man did. He got started and cost a whole lot more and had to stop. What happened to this saw your point down here? I, I didn't know that today. Did it tear up the houses that they already built in there? The road's even grown up. Somebody didn't count the cost or didn't give the logistics enough thought or something. Things are going to change, I know. Things are changing. Praise God for the change. We had a message preached to where it was given that the New Jerusalem was going to be the big old motel for people that come up to Jerusalem to work. What a big one. Man, that would be a big one. 1,500 square mile, cube mile. The Lord let me know, and I, I, I hadn't even thought about it, about it that much, but the Lord is in my prayer time when I was praying for the pastor that preached that. I prayed for him. I didn't call him up and criticize him right off, but I prayed for him. The Lord let me know, you don't know what I'm doing. Nobody knows what I'm doing. I have a city so big, and it's going to be wonderful there. You don't know what I'm doing. So don't act like you know what I'm going to do. Because I love new things. The Lord loves new things. You know that? I love new cars. I don't like a used car. I, 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 like, a, I like the smell of a new car. I try to keep it smelling that way as long as I can. I like new things. I like new clothes. I like new this and that and the other. The Lord doesn't love humdrum stuff all the time. He, there are some things that you can't change. You can't change the doctrine. You can't change the doctrine of the Trinity. You can't change the paramount tenets of the faith. You can't change these things. Where did we all go wrong? Where did, where did the people go wrong when tongues would offend anybody? Why do we have to be so protected when we get up in school and when our kids are persecuted for their beliefs and their faith. Why, what, where, where did it all go wrong? It's because the church is not doing its job. It's because the church is not preaching the gospel. The church is not sharing. We're shut up in walls. We're closed up. We're shut up. And we shut up and we don't take it out. But thank God this church is not that way. I know you're not that way. Thank God you'll never be this way. You're the church of the living Christ, and the church of the living Christ will carry the gospel on. Lord, the Lord knows that I, I, I want to obey him, my administration. He said there are some people there in the church that have gone the way of Cain. They Gone, some of them have committed the error of Balaam. And some are grieving at the gainsaying of Korah. I want to just barely touch on these because I'm already out of time, already past time. The way of Cain was, you remember in rage, he went out and killed his brother Abel. Because why? Why did he kill him? Because his jealousy rose up when he saw that God accepted Abel's offering. But Abel had thought this offering out. It was a blood offering, an offering of the first thing of his flock, the first shedding of blood. It was a blood offering. That was the reason why it touched the heart of God. He had already sought out God, and he sought what would please him. What we must do is always please God. We must always please God. Regardless of who else we please, we must please God. The way of Cain was one that we don't want to get into. The way of Cain was jealousy and 
rage, even to the point of murder, of his own brother. The error of Balaam was that he could sell his gifts of prophecy and gifts. Balak, you remember, called him and said, come on up here, I want you to come and curse these people. Every time old Balaam would open his mouth, he would bless them. But in the beginning, he almost didn't go because God tried to forbid him to go. He asked God, can I go? Have you ever, have you ever thought God say, and you thought you knew what not to do? You knew what not to do already. But then you kept praying about it. Kept asking God, Lord, can I go? Can, let me go, Lord. Let me, the Lord finally said, go on. That's the way you want to do it. Go on. He knew not to go. He had already been told not to go. Every time he opened his mouth when he went, God said, okay, I'll turn his disobedience into a blessing for me. But then this guy turned around and polluted the children of Israel by giving them some bad advice and telling them after he'd done nothing but bless. He said, may my last end be like his. Praise God. And may my blessings be like his. But then he gave... Balak, the, the system to get the children of Israel down. In a marriage, there's the kids with his daughters with their sons, and their sons with his daughters. And you'll pollute the people. And, but he was polluted to start with, with greed. Greed. He said, you know, when a guy, ask God to tell you this, when a guy talks to a donkey, you know something bad wrong. donkey talked to him, had a conversation with a donkey. This donkey said, why'd you hit me? He said, I hit you because I wish I'd have killed you, is what I wish. I wish I'd have killed you. Boy, if a donkey would have turned, turned around and said something to me like that, I'd say, whoa, what's the matter? What's going on here, buddy? But he had a conversation with a donkey. The donkey saw the angel standing in his path and turned aside and crushed his leg up against a rock. And he hit him. He got out and would have hit him some more. The donkey said, what would you hit me for? I ain't done nothing to you. What would you hit me for? And he, he, held, he said, I wish I'd have killed you, but I wish you, you'd hurt my leg. And the donkey answered him back and said, you would have been killed yourself had not been for me crushing your leg. Because that angel asked him that drawn sword would have killed you. But when you're greedy, that greedy and that fanatical and greed, that's what you need not to do. The gainsaying of Corey, this is a serious one here. The gainsaying of Corey, you remember that Corey got a hold, got in touch with uh, some of the other people, some of the other leaders, and they got up a conspiracy against Moses. And they started a rumor about Moses. Started talking about Moses. Well, he's not the only prophet around here. Who does he think he is, anyhow? He's not the only prophet. Just a young guy, red-headed guy. Don't know what... He ain't nothing to him. I know you haven't done that to this man. You better not. If you do, you're in spiritual trouble. Because God has his hand on this young man. Praise God. Let me tell you. Let, just let me tell you. Moses told him, said, come on and have a meeting with me. He ain't coming over there. You don't have your meeting if you want to. I'll just go and blah, blah. Have your meeting. I'm not coming. Moses finally got him to come to the, to the mount where the sacrifices were offered and so forth. And he said, God said, get out of his way. I'm going to kill them all. Get out of their way. God, you don't want to tick God off. You tick God off, you're in trouble. You, you, but this is some of the hard speeches he's talking about. Hard speeches that they've made ungodly. This man was mad when he said these ungodly people that talked ungodly, the ungodly deed, the ungodly attitude, the ungodly concept, the ungodly this, that. But 
Then the Lord opened the ground up under Corey and all that was there, and they went down live into the grave, into the pit. You know, I, I've never been where people went into hell alive. They're usually dead when they go into hell. But this time, I don't know, did that mean they bypassed the first judgment? Some of these angels that went in, left their first habitation, they are reserved in the chains of darkness right now. They won't come out until the middle of the tribulation. When they come out, and they torment men for five, several months. Don't want to ever get in this situation. Spots they are. Saying things they don't know about. Talking about things. I gave an illustration in the last service, and I want you to stand with me, and that's a good sign I'm quitting, and I won't preach 15 more minutes while I got you standing. God has a way of dealing with individuals. The high things, the high spaces. We're, we are, we talked about we, we are gathered together in high places in Christ Jesus. It talks about the high the attitudes of our mind, casting down imagination, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. He told us to put on the armor of God, the full armor of God, because we wrestle against principalities, powers, against powers in the high places. High places, your mind. High place. Somebody said, what does he mean by high places? Spiritual wickedness in high places. Spiritual wickedness in high places is spiritual wickedness of your mind. The mind surmises evil things. It gets you in trouble individually. Bothers you and causes you to lose out victory with God. Don't ever get that way. I don't I want you to read the whole chapter of Jude, just one chapter, read it. And I want you to dedicate your life again to God this morning. The church needs to always be the church. The church needs to never let go of the tenets of the faith. The church needs to always, if you need to change, there is some change that needs to be made. There's some good changes, there's some bad changes. There's some changes you don't need to make. You don't need to quit praying. You don't need to stop seeking God. You don't need to quit anointing people with oil. You don't need to stop congregating together as a man or some is. Some people look for an excuse not to have church, and some people look for an excuse not to go to church. Don't even look for them now. But you can't let this happen. If you do, you get in spiritual trouble with God. I want to invite those of you who are standing with me. You want to get rid of spiritual wickedness in high places. You want to deal with it this morning. Evil surmisings of the mind. I want a clear mind. I tell you, we hear stuff screamed at us all day. We hear stuff on ads and TVs. We scream this all day long. But we need our mind clear. We need our mind stayed on him. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. I want to invite you to make your way to, toward this pulpit. We're going to be dismissed from up here this morning. Brother Ray is going to come and dismiss you in just a second. But I want you to make your way up here. Just step out in the aisle. And make your way up toward the front. Everyone who will, just come on up front right now. Let's believe God and let's put our faith in him this morning. Let's trust in him and know that our mind is clear. That will, the devil will have a hard time getting to my mind because I'm always singing songs. There's not a minute of my day hardly that I'm not talking or saying something from my mouth that my mind is not controlled by a song or something, a praise or quoting a scripture. We must always keep it that way. It always has to be done that way. Would you just lay your hand over on somebody's shoulder here this morning or touch your hand? If it's a matter of contact this morning, let's just praise him. Let's just glorify his name this morning. 
Let's just worship him and glorify his name because he's wonderful, he's glorious, he's true, he's worthy, he's holy, he's, a, he's original. Praise God forever. <coughs> God, would you have your glorious way with us? Let our minds be stayed on thee, O God. Let our hearts be set on thee, O God. Let us know your holy will, O God. honor Pastor Emeritus Watkins for being here this morning. We're so appreciative that he's able to be here. I do want to say something about what I respect of, of him so much is that he's a man who loves God in every aspect of his life. His first and foremost important thing in his life is God, and I admire that. I want to share that with you this morning. If you're here this morning and you do not know God, you have the greatest choice in front of you right now to make him your Lord and your Savior. I can promise you through your entire life, there's no greater thing you could ever attain than that relationship that you have with God. This morning, I want to give you that opportunity to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's not about religion. It's not about church. It's not about denomination. It's about having that relationship with Jesus Christ who can forgive you from any sin that you have in your life. So this morning, before we close, would you just close your eyes just for a moment? If you happen to wander in here this morning, you just know that you're here for some reason. I want to let you know God has ordained for you to be here on purpose. And if you need to make things right with him, don't wait another second. You may not get another opportunity to make things right with God. Would you just honor him this morning by raising your hand and saying, God, I need to make things right with you. I trust you and I want to give my life over to you. Is there anybody here tonight? Great. There's two people. Is there anybody else? Raise your hand and say, God, you know exactly where I'm at in my life and you know exactly what I need. There's another hand. There's another hand. Is there anybody else? I know this is make you nervous, can make you scared, but the Holy Spirit is ministering to you right now and touching you right now and letting you know this is the, your opportunity. This may be your only opportunity. There's two more hands. Is there anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Angels are celebrating right now at this very moment because you are making the most important decision you've